Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Crash of 1929, an online professional development seminar sponsored by the PBS series American Experience and the National Humanities Center. My name is Richard Schramm. I'm the Vice President for Education Programs here at the Humanities Center, and I'll be moderating the session this evening. Now, I see among our participant list that, that we have an awful lot of repeat offenders who have heard my introduction of the center many times before, so I'm going to go through this very briefly. For those of you who are new to our seminars, you can find all of this information simply by typing National Humanities Center into any browser. That will take you to our website, and you will be able to have access to all of the material I'm going to go through very quickly here. We're located in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. The National Humanities Center is an institute for advanced study which means that the main program we run here is a fellowship program that brings scholars from this country and abroad to the center to do research for an academic year in topics in history, literature, and language, philosophy, and criticism of the arts. We are distinctive among humanity centers in that we maintain a vigorous program of outreach to teachers. We do that in three ways. The online seminars, which you've discovered, I urge you please to take a look at our uh, online seminar page now because there you will find our new schedule for the fall. I think you'll find a lot of really exciting topics. Uh, please sign up for them. We also have a website called TeacherServe, which provides information on topics in uh, religion in American history, the, the uh, environment in American history, and African American literature and history. These are essays written by leading scholars that explore important topics in these areas and also offer advice on how to teach them. In our toolbox library, you'll find teaching anthologies that pull together primary sources, historical documents, literary text, images, and audio material, and they make them usable for classroom instruction by providing you extensive notes and discussion questions. If you become a fan of the National Humanities Center of Education programs on our Facebook page, you will be made aware of all the new uh, materials and new products we put out and any changes that, uh, that we might uh, make in them and new seminars. So please do that. Become a fan of the National Humanities Center and stay in touch with the education programs. Now, after this seminar, I hope to return to the uh, website for um, uh, the crash of 1929. Somehow we have the wrong website up here, but you went to a website for the crash of 1929, and that website uh, afforded you access to the text. You will find there a recording of this presentation, a recording of the PowerPoint, and you will also find your evaluation. Please submit that evaluation to us. You can fill it out online. just takes a few minutes. Click Submit, and we get it. It's very important to us. We pay attention to what you tell us. As I said, you will find a copy of the PowerPoint there. Please. Feel free to plunder it. It's there for your instructional use. If you want to take some material from the PowerPoint into your classes, that's what it's there for. Now, how the seminar works, those of you who have been with us understand. It'll be lecture and discussions, key to a presentation of slides. We want you to participate. We urge you to participate with questions and comments and responses to discussion questions. And let me remind you again that the PowerPoint presentation is presented as a potential tool for your teaching. Now, those of you who are new, let me just quickly go over how you can participate. If you want to raise uh, your hand and uh, make a, an oral comment, you can click on the little hand raised icon right there. I will see it because it will pop up next to your name. And then I will pass the microphone to you. Right now, your microphone icon is red, which means that it's muted. When your microphone is turned on, it will be green. If you don't want to uh, speak up uh, and you want to send a chat message, put your cursor in the chat box right there where my arrow is pointing, type your message, and hit send. Your message will then appear in the chat box uh, above the send box. I will be uh, monitoring the chat, and uh, I will bring it into the conversation at appropriate times. You will receive from us documentation of participation. This will be an email letter that uh, certifies that you participated in the seminar, and you'll be able to present that to your local certifying authority for uh, whatever recertification credit participation in the seminar uh, warrants you. Now, before we get underway, are there any questions uh, about uh, how to participate in the seminar? If there are no questions and everybody's ready to go, send me a smiley face. There, Ginger Park has sent me one. Let's see some others. You just click on that little icon. There we go. Great. Looks as if we're ready to go. So let's plunge ahead and find out about the crash of 1929. Our goals this evening are three. 
We hope to analyze the immediate reactions to and proximate and deeper causes of the 1929 stock market crash. We also want to consider the 1929 crash in light of the earlier regular occurrence of financial panics, the subsequent history of comparative financial stability, and the more recent return to financial instability. And we also want to suggest some teaching strategies for integrating textual and visual primary documents with quantitative evidence. Now, in the uh, seminar form, many of you raised some, uh, some excellent questions. How did the crash come about? How did it affect the lives of ordinary Americans? How did the crash affect the global economy? How does the crash relate to the Great Depression? How does the crash of 1929 compare to the Great Recession of 2008-11? And finally, many of you lamented, will we ever learn? Now, Ed Ballison, our seminar leader, took your questions and added to them and refined them, and he developed these, these questions, which would be excellent questions for you to pose to your students before viewing the PBS documentary, the American Experience documentary, The Crash of 1929. Just how broad was the class of investors in the 1920s? How powerfully did speculation reshape popular culture? What prompted the boom in stocks during the 1920s? How did the pervasive use of leverage, investment based on debt, accentuate the upswing and the eventual collapse? What impact did the dramatic growth of modern consumer credit have on the 1920s boom, as well as the impact of the stock market crash on the wider economy? What accounted for the extraordinary confidence that economists and many politicians placed in the American economic institutions and financial markets before and even after 1929? How did Americans initially respond to the 1929 crash, personally, culturally, and politically? How does the crash of 1929 compare to earlier financial panics? Why did financial panics not recur in America during the several decades following World War II? And how, if at all, do the events of the last few years place the great crash in a new analytical light? To lead us through those questions, we're very pleased to have with us Edward J. Balassine, who is an associate professor of history at Duke University. He was a fellow of the National Humanities Center in 2009-10. His research interests include legal history, politics, and public life and governance. In 2010, he edited Government and Markets Toward a New Theory of, Regulator of Regulation. In 2001, he published Navigating Failure, Bankruptcy, and Commercial Society in Antebellum America. And while he was here as a fellow, he worked on a book with a wonderfully timely topic, Suckers, Swindlers, and an Ambivalent State, A History of Business Fraud in America. And believe me, when he was here, people were asking him a great deal about the history of business fraud in America. So Ed, let me pass the baton to you and uh, make you the uh, host here. Okay, Ed, program's all yours. Tell us what happened in 1929. Well, thank you very much, Richard. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, our focus tonight is arguably the most uh, dramatic single episode in American economic history, the stock market collapse in the fall of 1929. Uh, now, uh, I just want to uh, emphasize the, the depths of that fall. So if you have a look at this chart here, uh, in that, that moment in, uh, in, in 1929, from October to December, uh, the value of the stock market dropped a little bit more than half. Uh, an, an episode that uh, uh, in many ways uh, served as a trigger for the emergence uh, of the Great Depression. This event, of course, has renewed salience in light of, uh, of recent uh, events with the panic of 2008 uh, and the depth and reverberations of that panic in what many people now refer to as the Great Recession. I, I want to give you just a, a brief sense of, of the plan for the seminar this evening. I'd like to begin with the momentous developments of October 1929 as chronicled by the American Experience documentary, uh, focusing especially on the emotional dimensions of the crash, the, the ways in which people processed it and made sense of it. Uh, then I, I want to put the, the episode in a, the broader flow of, of time in American history, uh, first considering, considering approximate uh, and then perhaps a little bit uh, 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 more deeply structural causes of the crash, uh, pay some attention to the role of the stock market crash in bringing about the wider economic collapse into the 1930s, 
um, and then end by considering this event uh, against the long-term ebbs and flows of the American business cycle, uh, both looking backward to the rhythm of, of financial panics and crises in the 19th century and then ahead uh, to a roughly half century of economic stability uh, as well as more recent renewal of, of economic turbulence. Uh, one brief comment about the scope of our discussion. Uh, we're really going to be zeroing in on the significance of the stock market crash. Um, so uh, while we, we will have um, uh, certainly uh, some discussion about the connection between the crash and the ensuing depression, the, the uh, seminar isn't structured so much around the social experience of the Great Depression, uh, nor about its um, uh, wide-ranging political ramifications. Okay, so um, let's begin uh, in earnest. Uh, with a focus on the personal implications of this stock market crash. Uh, now, the documentary uh, that you've all had a look at, I, I assume, as well as the documents um, that I asked you to read, offer you many vantage points on how Americans experience this episode. So I'd like to begin by asking you all, if you were to have a class discussion about uh, this, the social experience um, of, of the stock market crash, drawing on the documentary, as well, um, you know, it's images of, of the stock exchange, the streets outside Wall Street, um, uh, outside the exchange rather on Wall Street, uh, the cartoons like the one, uh, you know, this one from uh, Life Magazine uh, in, in the immediate aftermath of, of the crash, uh, the oral histories of market participants thinking back on it many years uh, into the future like the one from Arthur Robertson that, uh, that I asked you to read. Um, what themes would you uh, hope students would emphasize in a, in a discussion in your classroom about the emotional responses to this crisis? Okay, <clears throat> good question. What themes do you think your students would bring up given their, their understanding of uh, the crash of 1929? Uh, probably the popular mythology was that people, you know, were clinging to, to the outcroppings of buildings and, and hurling themselves off. Uh, what themes would your students bring up? Maybe a few minutes for, or a few seconds for people. Here we go. Brent has a, a, a let's pass the microphone. Brent, uh, wait, there you go, Brent, it's all yours. Well, I think a theme that mine might bring up is, um, you know, talking about how people perceive Hoover to be the do-nothing president. Um, they named their camps made out of tents and, you know, cardboard boxes, Hoovervilles, because they were upset with the way he was handling, you know, the crisis. And, um, you know, politically, I think one of the biggest spending projects Hoover, um, you know, focused on was the RBC, and that was only $300 million, which pales in comparison to FDR's response to, you know, um, the Great Depression. So, so that's, a, that's, a, that's a great point, but it's also one that emerges over time. So I, for the moment, I'd like us just to focus on the fall of 1929. So this is before mass unemployment is, has, has gripped the economy. Uh, it's just a matter of coping with, with the, the plummeting values um, on, on the stock exchange. Okay, we have Christy Rice, uh, themes of panic, resiliency, and anger. Ginger Park picks up on the, uh, the, the uh, cartoon, suicide. Mandy writes the message from Livermore, um, taking all the furniture out back. I suppose that's another example of panic. Corinna has her hand up. Let's pass the microphone to her. Uh, Corinna, it's all yours. Uh, Corinna, are you there? Okay, apparently she's having some problems with her mic. Let's click that off. Corinna, you could please text your message in so that we can uh, hear what you so we can understand what you uh, what you'd like to say here. Furthermore, um, a change uh, from optimism to shock, initial inability to cope, that that kind of shock and paralysis, greed, instant gratification, lack of economic intelligence. Why did people not educate themselves about their own money? So here you've got um, shock again. What happened? America told, was told the stock market would keep rising and everyone would be wealthy. Students would think about how they'd be able to handle them, such, such a situation themselves. Could they really deal with losing everything? Read, still around, David says. So here, uh, Ed, we've got shock, panic, uh, paralysis, anger, uh, uh, and, uncertain, and uncertainty. And uncertainty. And so so uh, what, I guess the, the one point I would like to stress here, I, I noticed from the, uh, the comments that, that uh, you all made uh, in introducing yourselves to the other uh, participants in the seminar, uh, some of you have, have taught economics. 
Uh, well, you know, that's that's a discipline, um, especially the way it appears in, in, in uh, high school textbooks, that still stresses uh, overwhelmingly assumptions of rational calculation and dispassionate logic. And of course, that's true in a great many economic contexts. It's not true in the midst of a financial panic, by and large. Um, there, there's a, a, an emotional content to economic experience that, that really is brought to the fore in moments like this. Now, in order to sort of grasp exactly how much the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the message of, of the stock market crash came home to, to various groups of, of, of Americans, it's important to keep in mind just how uh, extensive participation in Wall Street was at this point in American history. Uh, so the, the American Experience documentary offers you a bit of an interpretation here. It gives you an impression of just how many people uh, were actually investing in stocks uh, in 1929, what, what kind of emphasis would you would you stress uh, thinking about the the uh, the points that the documentary makes? Okay, here we go. Oh, fear and greed. We're still talking. Corinne is still talking about the uh, the responses. Fear and greed, indeed. But how, what what what? How how would your students um, respond to that question? How widespread do you think investment was in the stock market in the 20s? Uh, Always seemed to me, from what what the popular conception I had was that you know everybody and his brother was was in the market. Uh, you students seem to think that way. Most students would assume that everyone was involved, writes Craig. So and and the documentary the documentary gives a number of examples of this. The the boot blacks were in the stock market. The grocery clerks were. The teachers. Uh, so that the, there's a sense I think in which the 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 uh, the likely conclusion that, that, that most people watching the documentary are, are likely to bring away from it is that this was an incredibly broad societal embrace um, of stock investing. And, and that was particularly true in a place like New York City, which was so close to, to the financial action, maybe less so um, at, in Kansas City or, or in rural towns. Um, the, the, uh, the point that I'd like to stress here you know, is that uh, one needs to keep in mind just how limited the stock market, uh, uh, the, the population of investors was. Uh, if I could just um, ask for an estimate, what, what percentage do you think uh, actually invested uh, in the stock market in 1929? This is, of course, a, a difficult thing to determine. There was no census of stockholders. But a number of historians have, uh, have, have attempted using a variety of different types of, of, of evidence to, to estimate this question. So I'm curious of your sense of that. Okay, we're getting 35%, 25%, 20, 30, 25, 25. Uh, here, Kim writes, my mother told me, she lives in New York City at the time, she's a teen, that everybody, everyone uh, her father worked with at the New York City Sanitation Department invested in the stock market, 42%, 15%. So, okay, so we, Brent's, Brent's closest, Brent's ah. closest. Um, it, it was around, the best, the best estimates would suggest it was probably around 12%. So that would mean something along the order of 3 million families. Now, if you look at AT&T as an example, that's the slide that I have up at the moment, uh, this was the most widely held stock in the United States uh, in 1929. Um, and it's, it, the, the number of people who owned shares in AT&T had gone up quite dramatically over the course of the 1920s, but it was still only at about 400,000 uh, at, at the, the peak of the, of, of the market boom. Uh, I think this is something that, that it's, it's really important to keep in mind, that, that, um, that it's, it's not, in some respects, that large um, a number. Nonetheless, uh, even though that was the case, um, it had gotten widely dispersed enough uh, that, that the crash raised immediate concerns over what its impact might be on, on the broader economy. Uh, and, and so here I, would, I want to extend this theme of the, the role of emotion in, in economic life, because I think it's really indispensable to understanding the political responses to the crash. And here again, we're talking uh, about the, that immediate response in, in the, the months just following uh, the, the, the break in the market. So let's consider two um, additional documents here. Um, one, a telegram uh, at literally the, on, on the, one of the key days of, uh, of the crash from a leading business executive. Um, well, the, the business executive actually uh, left a phone message and then, and then an aide of, of President Hoover sent a telegram to him uh, communicating that message. Um, and then after that, uh, this cartoon, uh, uh, again from the fall of, uh, of 1929, um, uh, going into a huddle. So let's start with a telegram. 
Uh, let me, let me, uh, 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 Richard, would you like to read that? Oh, sure. <clears throat> Mr. President, Mr. Rand of Remington Rand Company, New York, has just telephoned stating that he thinks you should issue a uh, statement to the press tonight for publication tomorrow morning, such as this. I am of the opinion that speculators' excesses, excessives that's, uh, on there have been thoroughly liquidated and sound investment securities have been reduced to a safe and attractive level. Now is the time for bankers, brokers, and investors to exercise the utmost of patience and cool judgment in all dealings with one another. Mr. Rand states that conditions are very serious, and if exist for a day or two longer, as they have for past few days, will result in ruining millions of business people. State's reaction, not alone in New York, but all over the country, as he has been in touch with different sections of the country over long distance phone, and state's business people of the country are looking to you for some such statement to save the situation. Richie. So, so what are, what's at stake here? What, what, what does Rand see as, as, as the, 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 the stakes of the situation? Okay, and while we're waiting for the responses to that, we have a question here from Renee. Were people buying stocks, were they buying into the value or the status of stock or believing in companies themselves? So is this a, was this a fad or, or, or were they, you know, what was propelling? What was propelling so that's a, that's a great question, and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna come back to that uh, at, at various junctures in the, in the, in the, the discussion. Uh, you know, it, there, was a, there, there, was a, there were a variety of motivations. Uh, one of the things that happens in the 1920s is that a lot of corporations start uh, paying their employees partly in stock. So that's one dimension of the increase uh, in, in, in the, uh, the number of people who uh, would be counted amongst the ranks of investors. Um, and then there were certainly uh, some investors who were engaged in an effort to ascertain value, the, the, the companies that they thought would make sense over the long term. By, by 1927, 28, 29, an awful lot of people are investing because they see that this is a speculative boom and they want to get in on it um, w without so much of a, of a close analysis of the underlying value of the, the companies that they're purchasing. So the motive sort of changed over time. Yes, I think that's right. That, and the balance have, between these things change over time. Right. We have a question from Marsha. Um, what was the comparison of participation in the stock market between rural and urban areas? Well, it would have been it would have been weighted strongly towards urban areas, but but it would not have been but not but not entirely so. So you've got a, a sufficient knitting together of information flows, um, and uh, uh, you have many stock brokerages that have that have opened up. Um, in fairly small towns by, by uh, the late 1920s. Uh, so, so while there still would have been an overwhelmingly urban character to it, the, the penetration would have existed to at least some extent in rural America. Okay. And now getting back to your question about the telegram, people are noting the urgency that is in uh, Mr. Rand's uh, message. Uh, he was concerned about the ruin of businessmen, not really about the average person. Um, and it's good he stresses patience and cool judgment. Business are looking to the government for, the government for reassurance and guidance. So, so on the one hand, there's this notion that uh, just, if we just get some cool heads, everything will be fine, but then there's also franticness. Um, and, and I think also in a, a, set, of, a set of assumptions that, the, the, that not only is optimism absolutely, absolutely crucial for the flow of, of economic activity, um, but that it's fragile. Um, and, and beyond that, that it's Hoover's primary job to maintain that confidence. So, so we, I think we can see this quite powerfully in, in the cartoon. Uh, what, what key points really really jump out at you? So I think this is an amazing image uh, with that athletic theme here. What what themes really strike you as um, as really if you were going to be using this in your classroom that you would want to direct students to notice? Okay, how would you use this in your classroom? It would be a great image to show students. Okay, let's see. Uh, it's, you have a question? No, we don't. Okay. Um, certainly, you've got the you know the the big burly prosperity railroad steel labor they they don't look as if they're suffering, but the, as Christie writes, the stock market in the back is feeble and broken, and Corinna writes, big business is uh, teaming up to beat the stock market problem. The stock market is the enemy of prosperity and industry. Here, Lee writes. Uh, I lived in a rural area. We found local newspapers from last month of 1929 and found great quotes in the mood uh, on the move from my community. We also look at political cartoons. Okay, big business isn't suffering, uh, and together with government, that we are strong and we'll save that stock market. 
Okay. See, the figures of prosperity, etc., have no face, no humanity. Uh, those virtues are brutes. It seems to stress that everyone is in this together, one of many, many who make one. Good responses there, Ed. I think so. So I, I, there, there's a notion that so people are pointing out for one thing that where where is the stock market? It's off on the sideline. Those figures are tiny and small. They're, they don't seem to be significant. Um, uh, that you know all the uh, not only are, are the, the crucial players in the economy the the capitalists, uh, the representatives of labor, uh, the people who run infrastructure. Not only are they uh, uh, pictured much more heftily. But they're all supposedly uh, uh, pulling together in a in, in a team effort. Um, now, what one sees here at the same time, though, is is a deep-seated fear about the transmission of anxiety from the stock market to the rest of all uh, uh, of the key players in the in the wider economy. Uh, the other thing you see here is that. Hoover is fulfilling his his role that 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 the the business executive had asked him to play as the morale builder in chief, uh, and and in fact, if you if you uh, look ahead from the the uh, fall of 1929, Hoover continues to try and do this for month after month after month. Repeated statements about how things are fine, the the, the basic structure of the economy is sound. Uh, speeches to this effect. Um, but but at the same time, you know, you sort of feel like the image here might remind one a little bit of uh, of Brad Stevens, the Butler basketball coach, in the second half during all of the timeouts the other night. Uh, you know, in retrospect, he's the repeated efforts to buck up economic protagonists um, with, without perhaps much in the way of of, of, of good effect. Um, I'd like to stress as well uh, the the way in which this gets at significant tensions in the elite responses to the stock market crash. Um, and I think we can see these, these, uh, these tensions also um, in uh, the, these, these excerpts, these quotes from uh, the Literary Digest article that um, I asked you to read. So on, on the left, there's a, a quote from the New York Sun. This again is just in the immediate aftermath of the crash. And on the right, uh, a quote from perhaps the foremost economist uh, in the United States at this point, Irving Fisher, who's who you also got to read a, an article from. So um, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to read these quotes, and as I do so, um, I'd like you to think about the basic message here about the the strength, supposed strength uh, uh, associated with the American economy. So from the Sun, the depression in Wall Street will affect general prosperity only to the extent that the individual buying power of some stock speculators is impaired. No Iowa farmer will tear up his mail order blank because Sears Roebuck has slumped. No Manhattan housewife took the kettle off the kitchen stove because consolidated gas went down to 100. Nobody put his car up for the winter because General Motors sold 40 points below the year's high. So long as America's industry is on a sound basis, we shall have prosperity. And here's Fisher. Relatively speaking, the 1929 stock market has been stabilized at a high level. And judging by the underlying conditions of business and industry, it bids fair to remain so. After this experience, the market should be largely purged of weak accounts. But unless I am wrong about the factors underlying the plateau to which the stock market has risen, there will be further tendency to rise rather than to fall as soon as the present conditions are stabilized. So what's, what's, what's sort of underlying these, these perspectives on, on, on the portents of the, of the stock market crash? Okay. <clears throat> What are the underlying assumptions here? Uh, these two rosy statements about the stock market crash. Well, in one, in one there, from the Sun, I mean, the, the, the author is saying that it's not really going to affect Main Street. The Iowa farmer, the Manhattan housewife, the, the guy with his, his Chevy. Uh, and, and Corinne, middle America. Corinne is making that point in the, in the chat, that the uh -huh. crash will not will not affect the lives of daily Americans. Uh -huh. And Judith notes that uh, it's appropriately, they're in denial. Stability equals prosperity, right, Sam? Uh, they make it sound as like stability is right around the corner. Corner. David writes, they seem to assume that it's just a hiccup, not something serious. That's right, the fundamentals uh, are, are solid. And as long as they remain solid, we have nothing to worry about. So, so let, me, let me offer you a couple of analogies to think about how one might interpret these quotes and, and, and think about the perspective behind them. Um, if one looks ahead 
basically what they're saying is this is going to be, uh, you know, if we had, if we could look here into the future, this is just going to be like 1987. A, a really substantial downward slide in the market, but it's not really going to have much impact on the wider economy. So here, here's another analogy that you might think about um, offering to students. In some respects, this is quite analogous to the outbreak of the American Civil War. In 1861, who the implications of Fort Sumter and what it was going to mean for American society? Well, maybe a few people had a decent sense of it. Uh, uh, William Sherman had a notion of what this might entail, but most people, North and South, pres presumed that this was going to be uh, that the Civil War was going to be a very short uh, battle that one side or the other would win quickly, uh, and then and then uh, life would go back to much as it had been before. Well, that turned out not to be the case, and that is actually obviously what 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 happened in 1929 as well. Uh, people often don't don't recognize just uh, when there's a really big turning point at the time they don't see it. It takes it takes a while to to recognize it. Uh, Zoe here, Zoe makes oh, yeah. a good point here that people will continue to spend. That that Iowa farmer is going to continue to buy from Sears Roebuck even though Sears Roebuck is slumped. I think that's a good point too. That's right. The the assumption is that the basic uh, the basic dynamics underlying the economy, the reasons to invest, the reasons to to buy, to spend, to consume, um, the reasons uh, to, to to keep the the engine of the economy going have not been really dislodged here. And of course, that turned out not to be the case. Um, so so here's another uh, uh, dimension of this. Uh, of the tensions within the elite reaction uh, to the to the the the, uh, the crash that, that I'd like to stress. Now, this we, we have, have a quick just if you give a quick yes. response to Jessica's question. Uh, how well known was Fisher, the economist at the time, and has has his uh, the fact that he was so wrong about the economy uh, in 20, has that changed people's opinions of him? Uh, Fisher was enormously well known amongst elites. He had the ear of politicians. He had uh, many, many different platforms from which to uh, to voice his opinions, uh, both to the economic profession writ large and to the broader public. Um, his his uh, reputation um, in, in, by the early 1930s had taken a big knock, uh, but then he stepped back and actually started analyzing uh, what had happened and where his mistakes had 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 come from and and. Uh, is part of the construction of Keynesian economics by the late 1930s and, and especially in the 1940s. So his 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 his, uh, his, his stock his, his own stock is rehabilitated to to some extent. So he redeems himself. Uh, uh, to, yes, he does. He does. Okay, we've got about an hour to go. So so now, um, if if one has a look at this uh, this next cartoon from November 4th, 1924, uh, uh, coming out of uh, I would stress. Uh, the Industrial Heartland, this, this initially uh, uh, is a, a cartoon that appeared in the Detroit News. Uh, really, I think this is a remarkable image, very interesting, uh, filled with, with, with interesting commentary on the situation. Um, what do you think your students would, would see in this image, and what, what might you want to point them to note about it, and, and how people are making sense of the significance of this stock market crash, again, just a week really after it's, it's transpired? Okay. How would you lead your students through image analysis of this of this uh, cartoon? Uh, I've never seen this one before. I think it would work really well in in a class. So, what would you have them? What would you hope they point out? I think the old man work looks like an uh, you know Ernest Hemingway when he was about forty. Okay, any uh, here we go. The working man is standing strong and ready to continue. Ah, good point. Good point. <clears throat> let's see the shadow of the axe coming down. At least I think it's an axe. Where? Let's see. Is there? Uh, I'm not sure. Oh, the perhaps the. Uh, uh, not sure. There's an axe. Speculation. Yeah, high flying speculation. And of course, the title: the prodigal son returns. Now, someone has to work for their wealth. Like it was mentioned in the documentary, no one worked for their wealth. It was done by speculation, watching the ticker tape go by. Easy money leaves quickly. American ethic is hard work. Looks like a plane crash, right? That is a plane crash. This cartoon confuses me. Help! Okay, add on that. Why don't you? Why don't you well, lead so, us through so, this? Yeah. So I think there's there's several of the comments I think uh, raise extremely interesting dimensions here. So, so one point I think that's unmistakable here is is that there's this this con uh, uh, very strong contrast between between uh, the bone and sinew of the of the country, the the people who who work for their 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 living. Uh, as opposed to those who are chasing after wealth uh, through through mechanisms that, that don't really require 
effort. So there's, there's an echo here of the 19th century labor theory of value uh, that, that I think is, is quite interesting. And the uh, old man work looks strong. He, he looks admirable. Um, the, the figure who has who, the pilot of the stock market, on the other hand, is a much more insubstantial figure. It's not clear to me what you know, even the gender of that of that figure is a little bit unclear. So you have this very masculine old man work, and I, I think you might argue a sort of effeminate, uh, speculative type uh, who has, uh, like Icarus, flown up to the sky, gotten too close to the sun, and 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 paid the price for it. Um, at the same time, so there, there are two other elements here that I would stress. One, uh, a notion that the, the the country has lost its way by focusing too much on this uh, easy chasing after wealth, um, and, and a, a suspicion from the heartland of parts of the country where that's the way people do things. There's, I think, a, an, a, an attack on uh, the metropolitan center of New York City that you might, might see here. Um, at the same time, there's a notion that the country is going to remain standing because the, who is the country? The country is old man work. Of course, this would turn out not to be the case in many respects. The crash uh, eventually uh, led to four years of dramatic economic decline, uh, by the end of which a quarter of the country was unemployed. Um, prices had, had cratered, asset values had cratered. Uh, I think I'd like to, us to turn our attention now to understanding the relationship between the stock market crash and that uh, broader set of, of economic uh, consequences. And the first thing I'd like to do there is, is to pay a little bit of attention to the boom that preceded the stock market bust. Because uh, it, it seems to me that, that, that uh, thinking about the nature of that boom, I think, is, is, is one important piece to understanding uh, the ways in which the bust then led to uh, such a profound economic depression. One key point here uh, that I'd like to stress is also suggested by this cartoon, um, and that's the connection of the stock market boom to the technological innovations of the 1920s. Uh, and most obviously, the the point here is that uh, one one aspect of that of that technological uh, uh, set of developments had to do with the uh, effort to move towards commercial air travel. So there's a tremendous amount of investment in airplane companies uh, during during this period. But but the same thing is going on, and is suggested by some of the advertisements that I had you read. Uh, this is this is the moment when the United States is truly constructing um, an, uh, an automobile culture throughout the society. Um, it's, it's the moment at which uh, one sees the m development of mass access to electricity and following from that the emergence of mass markets in, uh, in household appliances and in radios. Now uh, this is part of what's driving the demand for stocks during the 1920s, the notion that there are these new technological uh, possibilities that are going to bring enormous profitability to American businesses and those visions of profits um, are part of what's driving the interest in the stock market. There's this, I think, a strong parallel here to the type of dynamic that occurred in the 1990s with the internet boom. Uh, there's, there's a second point here that I want to uh, I want to make, um, and that has to do with the impact of the the, the, the stock market developments on Wall Street. Um, with the broader economic public mood. And I think that impact, one can make an argument, was, was much more substantial than you would think based on just the number um, of individuals who actually invested in the stock market. So let's, let's think for a minute about uh, sources like uh, the Gasoline Alley comic strip that ran through the 1920s, um, or uh, the constant news coverage and the type of news coverage that one sees uh, in this period. Uh, so, uh, you know, with headlines like like this one uh, from the New York Times, "Radio has made a new millionaire." Um, so, if if one reflects on um, all of these uh, documents that I've just uh, uh, run you through here, and the ones that you encountered uh, uh, in the the packet of readings, and also the basic uh, uh, messages conveyed by the documentary, um, what really would you want your students to um, to stress uh, to sort of pull out from these types of materials about about the popular engagement with the stock market um, during this period in the late 1920s. Okay, <clears throat> if you looked at if your students looked at Gasoline Alley and you were leading them through an analysis of that, what would you want them to see in this this image and in the the 
fleeting or the or the excited headline. It's not too late to still land in Florida. What would you like, what would like your students to see? I noticed the the uh, fellow there on the right looks like a mechanic or a working man. I mean, he he is not clearly an executive. There's no coat and ties. It's, it's a coveralls that he's wearing, um, suggesting the extent to which investment uh, fever uh, reached down into uh, society. What was the, the Gasoline Alley character, the, the guy on the left? Ed, do we know what he did? I, I can't remember the cartoon that much. Uh, he, he is uh, a, a friend of the, uh, of the mechanic, uh, same social class. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here we have Mandy writing. I think the idea that the normal guy is talking about margins is important. Yes, that vocabulary. Uh, Betty writes, it encourages you to invest um, that you would be crazy not to with all the money that there is there. Karina, he decides to buy stock even though he knows he can't afford it. He ignores his own better judgment. Christy, I guess the fact that the man on the left hasn't much money doesn't matter. Really, really perceptive comments. No, I, 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 I agree completely. Uh, so there, there's this popular fascination with what's going on uh, on Wall Street that, that is really suggested by these documents, as well as a, an indication that, that people really have a, a pretty deep-seated knowledge of the way things work on Wall Street. Not only that, that uh, there are particular ways that you can get into the market, but also, and this I would really want to stress, uh, a popular embrace of insider capitalism. Uh, an understanding, in other words, that Wall Street was, was a pretty opaque market in the 1920s, uh, that there were pools manipulating the market, uh, uh, pump, pumping up uh, values in order to get the public interested in particular shares as a way of, of, of goosing things along, uh, the possibility of, of, uh, of, of profiting from inside tips. Here with this uh, panel in the, in, in the strip, uh, there's this uh, notion that, boy, Bill's wife knows the secretary to the vice president of the company, so there's there's inside dope that you can take advantage of, um, and and a, 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 an embrace of the possibility of profiting from these types of advantages. Um, similarly, there's this celebration of of the most uh, 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 successful stock operators, even though they're in precisely because they're they're engaging in these types of of of, of manipulations and machinations. These people are in many ways popular heroes in the late. Uh, 1920s. Um, Jessica makes an interesting point about the first cartoon. The cartoon said when you make money, not if you make money. Uh, so things are only going up and up and up. Uh, you know, the, the market went up almost uh, a little bit more than 400 percent from the early 1920s to 1929. It's a tremendous rise. Uh, it doesn't seem like it's really conceivable that it, it's going to go down for more than a day or a week. Um, and even if, even if, this is another point I'd like to stress, is that even if uh, stock investors only constituted about 12% of, of the society, uh, two, uh, two things here. First, um, that's, that's a snapshot. That's a sort of estimate of, of how many people own shares at one point. A larger number would have owned shares at some point or another. Um, and that this also represents an enormous increase over the course of the 1920s. Uh, before World War I, uh, the, the distribution of, of stock ownership was much more restricted. Um, uh, ownership of securities tended to be uh, confined to the wealthy and to the reaches of the upper middle class, maybe the professional class to some extent. What, what changed this in, in, in initially uh, was World War I, uh, because in order to finance that conflict, the United States government uh, sold uh, uh, billions of dollars worth of Liberty bonds, and they engaged in a mass marketing campaign uh, to sell these bonds to the American public writ large, and millions of Americans did so. And that, uh, there, there's a new book that's coming out uh, by a professor uh, at the New School, Julia Ott, called When Wall Street Met Main Street, and she pays very close attention to this development. And then the way that that uh, Wall Street firms saw this potential market and sought to tap it through a variety of mechanisms. All throughout the 1920s, the New York Stock Exchange embarked on a, on a campaign to encourage popular investment in stocks. Uh, and they, they portrayed it as a way to give people a stake in industrial capitalism. Uh, and, and that message with the, the rising values of the market uh, gave an awful lot of people the notion that, well, the market does only go up, and hundreds of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people, uh, as a result, uh, were, were willing to, to join the boom. 
We've got a lot of people drawing parallels to the contemporary situation here, Ed. We've got about 45 minutes. Uh, and I want to I want to come back to that that can, those contemporary parallels at, at the end of our discussion. There's a third point here about the boom that I want to stress, and that has to do with the role of debt as an accelerant to the boom. If you want to use that metaphor, um, of fanning the flames of of uh, uh, that were that were heating up Wall Street. Now, a substantial percentage of of the investments, and in, especially toward the end of the 1920s, uh, were uh, on margin, there's that phrase that the mechanic is offering here. It wouldn't take much. You could put a, a little on margin, say 10%. Uh, now, uh, I wonder uh, whether we might reflect a little bit on this table here of broker's loans. Uh, and and uh, if we look at uh, the, the growth in broker's loans from 1920, uh, let's get the highlighter going here, to 1928, I mean, that is really a remarkable increase. Um, it's a, a growth of, of uh, uh, more than six times at the time, as the market is going up over this period, uh, uh, up to 1928, only about uh, three times. Um, so what, what does it actually mean to invest on margin, and, and why, why, you know, how would you want to get across to your students how crucially important that was for propelling the market up and then shooting it downwards once, once the, uh, the, the upward rise broke? Okay, what do you, <clears throat> you think that is? Now, buying on margin, that's borrowing money to buy stocks. You're buying, is that right? That's right. Okay. Okay, it's borrowing money to buy stocks. Okay, for and I was wondering why the brokerage numbers didn't crash to the ground in 1930 right after the crash. Is there any reason why it stayed relatively high? Good question. Uh, well, it, it, it's, it's coming down very rapidly. So there's still access. People can still borrow to, to buy stocks if they so desire. But note that it, it drops, uh, uh, even, even from 1928 to 1929, it drops to, to some extent. And it halves to 1930, and then it, 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 it drops uh, by two-thirds from 1930 to 1931, and then almost a half again to 1932. So, in fact, it is a really, really remarkable decline. Okay. We have a question here. Uh, when you buy on margin, you're buying on what you expect to make. That's right, isn't it? It is. So, I mean, think about it uh, quantitatively. You want to buy uh, $1,000 worth of stock. And you decide that you're only going to put up 10%. So, you're, you're going to uh, only purchase... Uh, you're only going to put up ten hundred dollars to buy that thousand dollars worth of stock. What does that mean? Well, let's say the stock uh, goes up. You've bought a hundred shares, and each share is ten dollars a share, and the the stock goes up uh, just just one just ten percent. It goes up one dollar a share. So now your your investment is worth eleven hundred dollars. Um, well, but in essence, you've you've made a hundred percent on your on, on your initial uh, investment because you put in a hundred and now you've made a hundred dollars. That's the power of leverage. Uh, it enormously increases the effective return on your investment as long as the market is going up. But the same powerful uh, mathematical reality obtains if the market turns south. If it goes down. Just as your losses were, uh, your, your gains were amplified on the way up, your losses are similarly amplified on the way down. Um, so, so uh, one one question that I just would, would be curious to know whether anyone ha has any thoughts about this: Why in the world would would it be possible to purchase stock with only 10% down? Why why would stockbrokers do that? Okay. While people are uh, contemplating that, we have some, some responses here. Um, Judith writes, buying on margin fed the desire for people with limited incomes to get into the market. Lee gives us a dramatic teaching, uh, a, a bit of advice here. And, and uh, Jessica seems to, be, she seems to be pretty savvy here. Does this chart account for people who buy stocks and then sell them on the secondary market? Well, most most of these purchases would have been on the secondary market because to get uh, to get a, an initial public offering of stock, that's the primary sale of stock. So when a company is actually trying to raise money for some investment purpose and they sell stock initially, um, 
in, by the 1920s, if you were a, a, not an insider, if you did not have really close connections to a company or to a stock brokerage, your capacity to get access to those, those initial public offerings was almost impossible. It's mm -hmm. only insiders that got access to the primary market. So these brokers' loans are entirely about the secondary market for the most part. Okay. And in response to your question about why did brokers do this, um, uh, Sam Liss writes, why did real estate brokers do it recently uh, for greed? Uh, same reason that banks loaned homes, uh, loaned money to home buyers, greed once again. Um, so, so the here, average, uh, go ahead. Yeah, those are, those are I think that, that there, there, there's much to be said for that. But what I would want to stress is that the willingness to loan for stocks was greater than the willingness to loan for anything else. And the crucial thing to keep in mind here is, is the concept of liquidity. You could sell the stock very easily. There was a huge market to do that. It was called the New York Stock Exchange um, and, or other stock exchanges in, uh, that were operating throughout the country. So the stockbroker had very strong collateral. If it happened to be the case that the market would go down, the broker could sell that stock and cover his loan very easily. And so that's what the, that's what the concept of a margin call was. That if, if, if the stock started to, to drop, then if you couldn't post more, more funds against your purchase of the stock um, uh, to, to reflect the fact that its value had decreased, then the stockbroker had the power to sell you out. Um, and this is crucial for understanding the dynamics of panic, this, this dynamic around uh, liquidity, because as the prices started to drop, People who had bought on margin, if they couldn't get more money to their broker, and as the one commenter pointed out, and one of the nice things about margin is it, make it made it much cheaper to invest so more people could get into the game, uh, the brokers would be forced to sell. And that downward pressure on the market for that stock. And this was happening across the market. Um, so just as leverage could be a way to extend profits, it also accentuated losses, and it then also could, could drive a self-perpetuating push downward in value as more and more shares came onto the market and had to be sold with nobody wanting to buy them, thereby dropping the price even further. Mm -hmm. Now, a key point here uh, connected to this is just that the extent of borrowing here on margin was not just the investors who show up in the documentary um, or the investors who show up in uh, the oral histories that I had you read. It wasn't just Groucho Marx. It wasn't just George Mahales, the South uh, Carolina restaurateur. Uh, it also uh, involved institutional investors that were playing with much larger sums of money. Uh, that would include uh, to some extent, life insurance companies, to a much greater extent, uh, investment companies. These, these are precursors of what we now think of as actively managed mutual funds. Um, and it includes as well this biggest piece of the pie over on the right, commercial banks. Um, these groups held very substantial percentages uh, of, of holdings in stocks, and they held many of them on margin themselves because they saw a possibility to extend their, their returns if they made their investments on the basis of borrowed funds. Um, so so uh, here is a, an even uh, you know, fuel added to the fire. It pushes the market up during the, the mid to late 1920s, and then it helps to explain the manic run-up. And then it, it also helps to explain the depth of the collapse as a result of all of the forced liquidations that were put on, into play as the market started to reverse course. Now we have we have a question here. If you could just quickly explain liquidity again, as I understand it, it's the ability to turn to sell something and turn it into cash. Is that right? Exactly. So if okay. you own if you own a business, a small business, selling that small business instantaneously is often really hard. You have to look out for buyers; they're not readily available. Those people might need to come up with financing. Uh, the, the great thing from the perspective of a stockbroker about stocks and why they were so willing to loan money against them and also why the banks were so willing to loan money to the stockbrokers to fund this all, this whole process, was the, the liquid nature of the stock market. The fact that there was, that there was this perception that, that you could always sell uh, a security, uh, a, a share in a company like AT&T. You could always find a market for that. And so it was a safe thing to loan money against. Okay, got a little over a half an hour. All right, so let's um, let, let me turn my uh, our attention uh, to the link between 
the, the stock market crash and the general economic downturn. Now, uh, my discussion here is going to be selective. I'm not really going to say much uh, about the impact of monetary policy or the, the flows in the international economy. So if people have questions about that, uh, they may want to raise them as we go. Um, but I, I want to I want to uh, start with the, the point that the depth of popular fascination with the stock market meant that the crash had, I think, an especially broad impact on general economic sentiment, something that, that's lurking in the background with all of those uh, cartoons and, and commentary that we saw earlier. On the one hand, everything's wonderful and fine, and on the other hand, oh, we're anxious that maybe it isn't. Uh, more importantly, uh, thinking back from the perspective of what comes uh, to pass by, by 1931, 1932, uh, it, it really turned out that there were some powerful vulnerabilities in the broader American economy that the stock market crash exposed. It wasn't just, and I think this is a very central point, it wasn't just that uh, the stock market uh, uh, speculation was founded in, in very substantial ways on debt, but the larger process uh, of American uh, uh, economic activity was also founded on, on a really dramatic expansion uh, of debt. Uh, what was going on in the 1920s was the emergence of a, of a new consumer economy. Uh, and as you can see in, in the ads that I had you uh, have a look at, including this one from Philco Radio, uh, um, many of these new consumer durables that were relatively expensive, radios, appliances, cars, as well as increasingly the sale of, of houses themselves, themselves um, were, were predicated on the extension of uh, the vast extension of, of consumer credit. You can get a, a hint of that, I think, from the, the joke that I had you read from, uh, from Life magazine. Uh, Smith, are you getting a new car this year, Jones? Yes, that is, as soon as I paid for the one that I had before the one I've got now. Um, so, I mean, I think this is an opportunity to, to give students a, a different kind of a source and, and to get them to think about what humor says about the public mood. Um, why, why would people have found this joke funny in 1929? Why would, it have found, why would they have found it funny? It's, it's, it's mildly amusing now. I mean, so it speaks to, I think, 2011. But why aren't people in 1929? Maybe I just answered our question. But. Okay, uh, we, before people respond, is there a mathematical equation to calculate the value of 1929 compared to today's money, and how much would a Philco radio cost in 2011? There is, I think, a, a website that there's a, yes, there's a, there's a great there's a great website. If you if you Google um, how much is that in today's money, you you'll find it, and you have a number of different options there for how to calculate uh, that. Um, one would just be the price deflator, so that is just let, let's just take what inflation has been since. Uh, 1929 and use that to calculate what it would be worth now. I don't like that measure so much as what the uh, what the proportion of a particular amount is relative to the overall size of the economy. I think that's the best measure of value and that tends to actually be greater than just the price deflator. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can do that for it. There, there, uh, you can you can find that calculation well back even in, I believe into the 18th century. Uh, economic historians have have okay. uh, have crunched the numbers and provided that to people. Okay, Lee Holder, uh, uh, we know Lee is a veteran of our seminars, really an inventive teacher. Notes that there's an Amos and Andy episode where they explain the stock market crash to the American listening public. It's great to use in class. Uh, to get back to your joke, um, Christy says is commenting on Lee says that sounds interesting, but I do think it the joke probably spoke to the to the popular mood. Comedy helps bring out the ills of a country without actually helping to alleviate the situation. Uh, you know, just I, I think maybe by this time, 1929, uh, February, of oh, this is before the market crash. So I was going to say it gave people a chance to look back and laugh, but it hasn't happened quite yet. Well, and I think it's, it's an indication that everybody knows that, that an awful lot of people are, are uh, pushing at the boundaries of, of, of their income yeah. uh, to take advantage of all of these new, new possibilities. Yeah, that um, date is important. That's right. It's it's in the midst of the boom. It's not it's not after it. And already people are, I think, a little bit nervous about it. Um, you you can see the uh, some commentary about the depth of the changes uh, in this commentary from from Middletown, a study in contemporary American culture, which came out again right at the height of the of the boom. Uh, 
this is a theme that the authors of this study uh, who, uh, well, let me just pose this as a question. Uh, do, do, do any of the people participating uh, this evening are they familiar with what Middletown was? Familiar with Middletown, the, uh, that work uh, by Robert Esland and Helen Maryland. And so I'm seeing several, I'm seeing several no's. Yeah, yeah, you, you a, just give a quick thumbnail sketch. So this is a this is a a path breaking work of social science by uh, by um, Robert and, and Helen Lind uh, who were operating today it would be hard to decide whether they were sociologists or cultural anthropologists they went over a, a four year period to a midwestern town which turned out to be Muncie Indiana and just spent a very long time closely observing the way that uh, life proceeded in this town and what what this segment from um, from their, their reflections, I think, stresses um, is the extent to which so much uh, of the, uh, the sort of outer, uh, uh, the, well, the, the, uh, so much of, of social life had come to revolve around pursuing material comforts. Uh, even in a place, not, we're not talking about here about Boston or Philadelphia or Chicago, this is a small town in, in central Indiana. Um, and, and uh, what you also get a sense of here is their notion that this is really something profoundly new, um, that this is, this is something dramatically different about uh, American economic life. Now, one, one thing that I, would, uh, that I would, would stress here is that you can overstate in some respects how new consumer debt was. It had lineages well back into, um, into 18th century America. Uh, 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 American farmers, did not tend to pay for their, uh, their goods at rural stores with ready cash. They tended uh, to have book accounts. Uh, and it's worth keeping in mind, the United States was very much a developing economy until the late 19th century. It was dependent on flows of foreign capital to make the whole economy run. Uh, most 19th century, even early 20th century retailers uh, had book credit. They would, they would often sell um, uh, on promises to pay rather than actual payment. But there's some new things about the 1920s that I would want to stress. A huge growth in the supply of consumer credit, the rise of new types of institutions like the finance company to make that happen, uh, a new kind of impersonality to the, the transactions involving consumer credit, um, and, and also the emergence of big ticket consumer items, durables like appliances, uh, radios and especially automobiles that collectively could take up a substantial percentage of uh, of a consumer's income, uh, even just to finance the, the the debt that was owed on those installment purchases. So the difference between consumer credit in the 20s and consumer credit before that was just the expansion of it and its use to 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 finance the purchase of all sorts of things. And also its form, because it's now collateralized in a way that it wasn't before. What I mean by that is that when you purchased a car, until you paid off the whole car, you didn't really own the car. And if you missed a payment, you could lose the car. Um, and the same could be true for a radio or for a vacuum cleaner. Um, this, had, this had profound implications, it turned out, for um, the way that, that people responded to the, the pullback in economic activity associated with with the, the stock market crash. If you were concerned about your ability to make payments on your car and you really wanted to keep the car, you, you only, your only option would be to pull back your consumption of everything else. And in fact, that began to happen uh, in, 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 uh, as, in early 1930 and extended into 1931 and 32. We have two good questions here. <clears throat> were there credit checks like there are today or was this a lesson from the, the crash in the Great Depression? And then was this boom in consumer credit something limited to the United States or was it a global uh, phenomenon? Uh, it, was much more, it was much more pronounced in the United States than it was in, in Europe um, or, or other parts of, of, of the world. Uh, although it would, it would come to those, those uh, uh, those areas after World War II. Uh, with regard to uh, credit reporting, it did exist, and it existed not only for business firms that wanted to borrow, but by the early 20th century for retail creditors as well. Um, but the, the, uh, one of the aspects of, of an economic boom is that uh, the, the optimism that suffuses stock investors also infused people who were analyzing credit risks. And, and so the, the, the willingness to lend expanded significantly um, as, as the boom really, really picked up steam. 
you can get a sense of the rapid expansion of private debt here with the, these uh, these figures that I've offered you in this in the slide that's up at the moment. Uh, one point I would stress here is that it's not simply the case that consumer debt was expanding rapidly. Farm debt was expanding rapidly also. The dynamic there is partly about consumption, but actually it was more about um, a dramatic expansion of productive capacity in, in the American uh, 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 countryside, uh, resulting, I think, most importantly from the dynamic during World War I. Uh, World War I brought about a voracious demand on the part of the world's armies uh, for, for foodstuffs, and it brought about enormously uh, big increases in prices for, for agricultural products. American farmers responded by uh, borrowing money to expand into new lands and to, to uh, 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 increase their capacity to farm. Uh, they began to uh, invest as well, in some cases, in, uh, in, in uh, machinery to improve their, uh, their productive capacity. All of this left a debt overhang in rural America. It also led to huge increases in production that, that, that began to bring about big price declines for agricultural commodities. Um, so, so you've got overextended consumers, overextended farmers, in general, overextended households in 1929 when this economic shock from the stock market hits. Uh, so there's structural vulnerabilities to that stock market crash uh, that, that unleashed powerful deflationary forces throughout the economy. Uh, it, that begins with, uh, that, 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 well, it begins in, in the farm economy even before the, the stock market crash. It's accelerated by the forced asset sales associated with, with all the margin calls. Uh, it, it began to percolate through the economy as the more general economic slowdown uh, uh, began. And then what's the, what's the, what's the, 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 the condition confronted by, by debtors, uh, consumer households that, that have debt overhang? Well, uh, paying off that debt is increasingly difficult because uh, by, the, by the early 1930s, wages are beginning to, uh, to, to, to uh, uh, decline. Uh, many people are losing jobs, and, and so this, this whole process begins to reinforce and, and, uh, and uh, uh, feed on itself. Uh, uh, one further point here, there are parallel dynamics with corporate finance. Firms had borrowed heavily to expand as well. So the widespread financial strains uh, began in 1929, uh, began to course through uh, the corporate economy as well, uh, and, and led uh, uh, to uh, uh, many different channels that accelerated the, the decline, including, uh, 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 including unemployment, uh, wage cuts, uh, job cuts, um, and uh, another channel that in which, through which the financial strains eventually helped to, to lead to bank runs and bank failures, which only made the situation much, much worse. All right, so um, we, we've got, I think, about 20, a little bit more than 20 minutes to, to, to go in, in the discussion. I want to stress one further point. Now, much of what I just said, I think, is, is uh, uh, consistent with the types of analyses that one would encounter in, in many, in many uh, high school textbooks. Um, I want to stress one other element here that, that maybe is uh, not stressed quite so much, uh, and that has to do uh, with uh, what you might think of as an, an intellectual uh, dynamic underlying both the boom in the 1920s um, and the initial perplexities among political and economic elites in responding to the challenges of the stock market crash and its, out, and its, and its aftermath. So this is a, this is a more diffuse dimension uh, of, of, this, uh, of this situation, one that I would be inclined to describe as a faith in market technocracy. So let me just read this, uh, this uh, excerpt from uh, the article by Irving Fisher about investment trusts in 1929. Um, and as I, as I read it, I'd like you to think about what Fisher was getting at, um, what, what he was saying about the, the, the capability of, of, of economic elites um, by this point. The investment trust principle acts to reduce risk by utilizing the special knowledge of expert investment counsel and by diversifying investments among many kinds of common and preferred stocks and bonds, foreign and domestic. It also operates to shift risks from those who lack investment knowledge to those who possess it. As a consequence, normally speculative properties gravitate into the hands of these skilled agencies which are better able to forecast their true future value. Many core of specialists employed by the investment trusts are watching out for these signs. They know about improved and cheapened processes beforehand and discount them in their purchase of stocks and bonds. By their influence, 
the steeper declines or ascents are drawn into milder ones. So what, what is, what's, what's Fisher basically suggesting about the people at the helm here of the economy? Okay, <clears throat> what's he suggesting? And while we're waiting for that, we, we have many people running uh, It's a Wonderful Life through their minds right now. <laughs> it's an appropriate movie. Uh, anyway, what, what, uh, what is uh, Mr. Fisher trying to, uh, to tell us here about, uh, about all those people who are investing in the market and putting their trust in the hands of um, investment counsel, expert investment counsel. He doesn't seem, you know, he, 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 he thinks obviously that the expert investment counsel really, uh, you know, they're the ones who, who understand this and can operate the levers and we can trust them. Yeah, well, they can trust those who know, as Marsha writes. And the average, the common man, that guy in the gasoline alley cartoon in the jumpsuit, maybe, maybe he's not the best person to, uh, to trust because it's all too complicated. So, so I think there's definitely that, that dimension. Um, I, I think there's another one as well. So, I mean, if we think about, about the comments from uh, uh, this individual who's quoted in this, this uh, uh, news story about the installment economy, the consumer economy, um, I, I'd like to just stress a parallel here. Uh, installment selling now covers this country and Canada, and depression, cons uh, considering the present financial organization available to limit the effect of panics, is not likely to cover the entire country at once. There may, of course, be black spots here and there that must needs be taken into account, but these, according to past experience, will not show up seriously when taken in relation to conditions as a whole. So uh, the idea here is that these people have figured out how to conquer risk. Uh, that they, they know how to uh, spread risk, they know how to diversify, they know how to uh, loan everywhere, they know how, how to uh, invest all the way throughout the economy. Uh, and the, the irony is that by, uh, that, uh, that by thinking they had conquered risk, they took, undertook steps which actually concentrated it. Uh, there, there's a very strong parallel here with what I think has happened in the last decade or so with the development of new financial instruments like credit uh, 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 like collateralized debt obligations and credit default swaps, uh, also instruments that were supposed to be about uh, uh, spreading uh, or hedging against risk that turned out to make it much worse in the midst of a, of a, a general downturn. Um, based, the larger point here is that there was tremendous confidence on the part uh, of the architects of finance and the political establishment uh, that that there was a new era in the economy and that the people at the helm really had figured out how to make a modern economy tick over. Um, this is, I think, a crucial dimension uh, of Hoover's perspective. It's, it's, uh, his, his, his public speeches are, are saturated with it. And I think it's a crucial dimension of the, of the crisis of imagination in the wake of the, cr of the crash. Um, it's a crucial dimension as well as to just why so many people were willing uh, to lend so much money in this era, whether for consumers or for stock investors uh, because of the confidence associated with, with this new, these new techniques. I'd like, to, I'd like to maybe finish our conversation with the last 15 minutes or so by widening the chronological perspective uh, and thinking about how you can get students to think across time. Um, and let, let me maybe start that effort uh, by considering 1929 in, uh, by, by looking backward at the 19th century business cycle. So I, I asked you to have a look at this chronology, um, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm curious whether uh, you have any thoughts about what really is distinctive about it or how you might uh, use this in your own classroom to get students to, to compare 1929 uh, to, to some of the economic dislocations that preceded it. Okay, when you're looking at that, we have a question from Lee Holder. Um, do you know if Hoover ever actually used the phrase rugged individualism, or have we just applied that? Looking backwards, um, I believe I, I, I'm not 100% sure about this, but I believe that that is is, uh, is is a phrase that he did use at one point or another. But I can look that up and get back to you in the in the in the post seminar discussion. Okay. Well, this this chart it struck me. I mean, I you know you, so many times we think of 1929 as kind of a an isolated event, but obviously this chart contextualizes it more deeply in American history. Um, here we have from Corinna, economic dislocations were quite common. The crash of 29 was so invasive and this is why it's so famous. Uh, so yeah, it, they're really more common in our history than I thought. That's what this, uh, this alerted me to. And they, have, they seem to happen almost routinely at 15 and 20 year intervals. 
Uh, that's right, and there, there were smaller kinds of financial disturbances that would happen uh, that would happen in between these larger crises. Um, but but before before the the New Deal, these these were regular occurrences uh, in the American in the post-revolutionary American economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know some some um, teachers have already used this chart uh, in their classes. Um, the good thing, the good thing is there has always been an end. Well, yes, thank God. <laughs> uh, I, one thing I would want to stress is is how one could conceptualize why this was the case, or where what the motor behind the business cycle was, why why it tended to have this this periodicity to it. Um, I would want to stress. That the, the, the 19th century business cycle, going up through the early 20th century to to the the crash in 1929 and the ensuing Great Depression, that this this business cycle was really distinctive from the one that obtained from World War II onwards. Uh, I think in each of these cases, uh, the boom phase was set up by the emergence of some new economic frontier, sometimes geographic expansion. Uh, 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 some you know, in, in the early in the antebellum period uh, associated with uh, Indian removal and the expansion of the, the slave economy into the, the Southwest. Uh, sometimes the, the development of new types of natural resources, uh, oil, mining, uh, sometimes associated with the construction of new types of infrastructure or with industrial breakthroughs. These punctuate the entire uh, the entire century. They also were amplified by financial innovations, new instruments to extend credit uh, and to funnel capital into new economic sectors, um, all of which uh, brought about uh, uh, a growth, a substantial growth in indebtedness into the, into the larger economy and new forms of indebtedness that people hadn't worked out uh, the implications of so, so clearly. Uh, in other words, they all they all built up a set of, of economic vulnerabilities to any kind of economic shock. And whenever that shock occurred, uh, you would get a financial panic and the same type of cascading uh, uh, process of liquidation that one sees in 1929 with plunging asset values, uh, sometimes stocks, sometimes bonds, always land, uh, and a general process of deflation that would course through uh, the society. Uh, one thing I would point out here, though, is is the difference in the length of the resulting economic downturn, the, the, the amount of time it would take the economy to get to the point of, of production before the bust. Uh, two to six years from 1819 to 1907, there's something very different, obviously, about 1929, 12 years before the economy was as large, again, as it was before, before the crash. Um, all right, so uh, let's finish off with um, with a look ahead from 1929, as, as well as perhaps a little bit of a look behind. Um, I hope you all had an opportunity to have a look at this uh, this graph uh, that I that I uh, put into the packet. Uh, it seems to me that there are really some enormously fascinating correlations here with this with this graph, um, and. I'm just going to uh, remind you of, of what's, what's on the graph. It's got a lot of moving parts to it. Um, and as I do that, I'd, I'd like you to think about what reactions you had to it. I'd really be interested to hear what, what you made of this um, uh, and, and uh, what, what struck you most forcibly about it. Um, so what you have here on, on, with the blue lines um, are the number of bank failures uh, in the United States from 1864 through uh, to 2009. And then also there's another measure of, of that, which is uh, the amount of total deposits within failed banks. And that, that only starts uh, in about 1920. So that's one piece of information that you have. And then there's a, a, a depiction of uh, the share of income held by the top 10% uh, uh, of, of families in the United States from the period of roughly 1914 up through the present. Uh, and then there are a couple of, of, uh, of chronological markers having to do with, uh, with banking regulation in the United States. Um, so what would, what would you want students to see in this, in, in this graph if you were to bring it up in class? Okay. Christy writes, I thought this was an interesting graph. The share of income seems to correlate to a sudden drop following, I guess, following a crash here. Um, right. Yeah, why would you this this give you 
good chance. I know that in some of your <clears throat> um, standards, you one of the things you want your students to see, or the state is asking you to study, is how well students can interpret graphs and charts. This one looks complicated, but when you when you work it through, it's it's really not. This graph makes me very grateful for the New Deal banking regulations that helped to prevent the Great Depression. Part two, I would have students look at the share of income held by the top. Okay. Yeah, that, that period between the two dotted lines, that there you seem to have uh, more equitable distribution of income, many, many fewer bank failures, uh, total deposits have failed and assisted institutions, uh, that drops, and it seems to be a, a pretty solid period. So, so, so there are two correlations here in the comments that have come through, and I'd like to talk about each of them uh, a little bit in turn. So one is that there seems to be a correlation between relative economic inequality and susceptibility to systemic financial instability, to crises, to booms, to crashes. Um, so that's a really interesting correlation. But, but is it causation? What would be the, the mechanism that would account for the, the causation if it exists? Um, now, that, that's a, I'd really be interested to hear if people have any thoughts about that as to what, what might be the possible connections between economic inequality and financial instability, booms and busts. Okay, about the relationship by na between financial inequality and uh, booms and busts. Uh, greed connects booms and busts. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So what would be that connection? Marsha agrees about that. Yeah, I would think that uh, when you concentrate more money in the hands of uh, fewer people, uh, the economy can be manipulated more easily, I should think. Um, so, and so what, what one might expect, one, one possibility, if, if, if Marcia and Corinna uh, and David are correct, um, would be that a growing inequality leads people perhaps to want to speculate more. Mm -hmm. uh, that the, that the, that the uh, example of people making fabulous wealth uh, is uh, a siren song to many other people to try and emulate them. It also might be the case that people with enormous economic resources uh, have a, a tremendous amount of disposable income and more than they can possibly consume, and so there's this ready amount of, of funds with which to speculate. Um, let me David offer a couple. Knows, David yeah. knows this is the Powerball syndrome, the lottery exactly. syndrome. Yeah, good, exactly. good way to put it, David. Um, so, and now Lee Lee makes this very a point that uh, another point which is related. Um, that, that I, I would like to stress as well, that perhaps with widening inequality, there's a stronger pull to keep up with, with the neighbors, uh, the, the desire to, to keep up appearances, to uh, maintain the, the newest and the best type of, of material goods that have come onto the market. Uh, and maybe that might be associated with a greater willingness to borrow for consumption if necessary. Uh, and by, by the same token, maybe it might uh, help to explain the, the burgeoning supply of consumer credit uh, in the midst of those periods, not just, uh, not just in the 1920s, but also since, since 1975 or so, and, and really since 1985, uh, that if you have a relatively growing uh, uh, degree of, in, of income inequality, it's harder for the mass to consume on the basis of, uh, of, of what they have in the bank. Um, and so if you're a marketer, if, you're a, if you've got things to sell, if you want to move the product, if you want to sell your services, it, it behooves you to think hard about how to uh, uh, link those, uh, those efforts to the, the provision of credit. Um, all right, so what I want to stress, though, is that, that these reflections at this stage are really more hypotheses than they are demonstrated historical facts. These are questions that historians haven't paid that much attention to over the last two generations or so. Um, and uh, they generate, I think, some really powerful hypotheses for, for new types of, uh, of, uh, of historical research. So let's now think about the other correlation uh, that people raise, the one between um, the degree of economic regulation uh, and, and financial stability. That also seems very powerful. Wow. Uh, you introduce federal deposit insurance uh, associated with that. You put restraints, various kinds of restraints on banking. Not only do you, do you uh, create insurance mechanisms to try and stop bank runs so that people will have confidence uh, that even if one bank goes down, their bank isn't going to be next. 
um, you you tight you you can't you uh, uh, as the New Deal reformers did you you uh, pair that with uh, much tighter standards for uh, for for loans, uh, much tighter requirements for capital in in banks, uh, and at the same time there's a much much stronger regulation of the stock market, prohibitions on the most uh, uh, blatant kinds of manipulations of the market, prohibitions on insider dealing. Uh, re requirements of much greater provision of information about corporate uh, uh, accounts and and, uh, and and standing to public investors, all of that's put in place, and uh, and at the and, and in the aftermath of that, uh, almost no financial instability um, until the last um, uh, uh, couple of generations. Um, so, let me pose a, a, a slightly different question about this correlation. Can can anyone think? Uh, of arguments about why maybe regulation wasn't so significant to this period of stability. Um, you know, if, if, if could could you imagine asking your students that? So could you generate other ideas that might help to account for why uh, the the economic system uh, avoided financial crises uh, or massive swings in in uh, in output, really really dramatic recessions? There were certainly uh, small scale recessions, but but nothing like the 1930s. And while I'm thinking about that, Marshall writes, can there be too much regulation that can affect things in a negative way? Well, that's, well, that certainly can be the case. I mean, one can point to, to many, many examples uh, where, where, where that is the case. Um, I think it might, be, uh, uh, it, it might be difficult to do that with respect to bank stability in this period. Um, there certainly were a lot of complaints from banks in the era up to the development or deregulation about the way in which regulations were hamstringing them in various ways, keeping them from developing uh, integrated national bank branching systems, uh, making it uh, more difficult for them to compete with European and Asian banks that were able to engage in investment strategies that the New Deal regulations prohibited. Um, so so there, there cert this was certainly uh, a, a, the nature of the debate that, that uh, moved the United States onto a path of deregulation. Right. To get back to your question, uh, Ginger Park writes, people uh, in that period uh, between 1929 and about 1979, uh, people just didn't have the money to invest yet, which is why it worked, which is why you didn't, you didn't see the economic instability. That's one, one theory. That, so that might, might, that, that might be one thing to, to look at. Well, what was the propensity of people to invest in that, in that era? Let me let me suggest another couple of possibilities. One would be the impact of World War II, oh. uh, which led to a period of American economic dominance. Uh, its foreign competitors uh, in Europe, uh, in 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 Japan, were uh, were in ruins. Uh, American corporations bestrode the world, uh, and and American de economic dominance was so enormous uh, that it it brought profit such profitability to the economy that that there would be no instability of any, any significant kind. Uh, here's a, here's an, another possible explanation. Uh, and of course, these are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, generational amnesia was really strong after 1929. If you think back to the documentary, there, there are these uh, really interesting comments from people who, were, who remembered it, who were in the financial industry, who were in Wall Street, and they remembered what it was like in 1929. Um, and you get that very powerfully from this uh, uh, interview with John Hirsch, uh, the senior partner of a Chicago investment house, who has no doubt about the centrality um, of, of regulation to, uh, to the relative stability in the marketplace. Uh, but he also has this sort of searing sense of just how massively significant the experience of that crash was on the consciousness of so many people in the American business community. Now, um, I guess what I'd like to end with is a sense that, uh, that it's worth keeping in mind in communicating to your students that history remains open-ended. Um, the, past, the past is always changing because we have new points of comparison, new perspectives to bring to it. Uh, and that, that generates new questions and new avenues for research. Uh, and I think the, the, uh, the degree of, 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 of uh, connective uh, uh, tissue, uh, the extent to which the events of the last uh, several years um, draw parallels and also important differences to the dynamic after 1929, 
uh, is a nice example of that and one that I think it would make enormous sense to raise in the classroom. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our session. <clears throat> you have any final questions, comments uh, before we wrap things up? I think we got a lot of really good classroom um, material here, those graphs and the cartoons. I think they'll be really useful. Uh, how much time do teachers here in the group usually spend in class and discussing the causes of depression? Um, I'm just, I'm just curious. So you want to respond to that in the chat. Uh, those of you who um, can, we have a question here. What percentage of today's society participates in the stock market? Ed, do you have any idea? Uh, well, it's, uh, I, I believe it's at the moment it's about 41%. 41. That's, mo that's mostly through uh, uh, indirect uh, ownership in the market um, through mutual funds. Yeah. So, um, in, in many respects, that's a, that I, I would uh, uh, point out how low a number that is. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, 60% of, of the American public has no exposure to the stock market whatsoever. Yeah, and, and that, that is low considering the you know the proliferation of IRAs and kind of you know plans that you must uh, uh, squirrel away your own retirement now. Um, but what's all, what's also gone on over the last couple of generations is a dramatic decline in in the uh, in, in pension funding, right? For uh, for workers, uh, especially those in uh, in non white collar occupations. Right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as I said, we have come to the end. I want to thank Ed for giving us an excellent seminar, and I thank all of you for your intelligent and energetic participation. Use the forum to continue the discussion. We'll monitor it until April 22nd. Uh, in the meantime. Please go back to the Crash of 1929 website and submit your evaluations. As I've said before, they are very important to us and we pay a lot of attention to them. Hope to have you again in one of our seminars. And for this evening, I want to say thank you and good evening.